All right, we've got a great show lined up for you today. We're going to talk about tactics. We're going to talk about technique. We're going to talk about coaching and a whole lot more. So sit back, relax, and let's get to it. Hi there, I'm Mark Renison. Welcome to another episode of Pickleball Today. Whether you're playing in a tournament or you're just playing for fun, I bet you want to play well. So come on out on the court. Let's warm up. All right, I like to start my warm up with just a light jog. And if I've got a pickleball court to use, I'll use that. I'll even go all the way around the court if my opponents aren't out there yet. Just to loosen up a little bit, you're going to have to run around. And yeah, if you want to hit the exercise bike or the skipping rope, that's a good idea too. After a little bit of forward running, I am going to start to mix things up a little bit. Pickleball, of course, you change directions. You're not always running straight ahead. So we should start to simulate that a little bit. I also want to keep this going so I got a bit of a sweat going. So I might leave those sweats on a little bit longer. Try to keep that movement constant. Shuffle back and forth. And you'll see it's a pretty light shuffle, right? I'm not having much of an athletic look here, standing pretty upright. So then I say, okay, well, I gotta get that upper body going too. Haven't done a lot of things above my head during the day, so better warm up these overhead smashes. Again, you should always be careful moving back for these things. Moving back isn't the dangerous thing, it's the falling that's the dangerous thing. So don't do anything that might hurt you. Of course, you should always warm up on the forehand and backhand side. You wanna be good no matter where your opponents hit that ball. And after a little bit of this, I'll say, wait a second, after I hit that smash, there's a good chance my opponents are gonna play a short ball. So I'm gonna have to come up and play a dink have a little bit of combo action here the smash dink coming forward and again you can do this as sort of aggressively as you want early on I'm still doing this as a pretty light version it's right at the start of the day nothing wrong with a few old-school arm circles and some body rotations you know what your body's gonna kind of tell you you're gonna feel where you're a little bit stiff or a little bit looser so do what feels good to you just Try to keep it going and realize that you should gradually increase the range of motion. So early on, you might not move quite so much, and as you start to warm up, then you can let it go a little bit more. Driving the ball is pretty important, and you'll notice here I use different stances. Sometimes it's a closed stance or a neutral stance, and here you see me using that open stance as well. Why? Well, because that's what's going to happen in a game. Right? you got to set up differently, and that's going to use different parts of your body. All right, I always feel after a long day of playing pickleball, those hips are a little bit sore. Not quite the young pup I used to be, so I'm gonna do a little bit of hip flexor activation. But if you wanna do this standing still, you can also work on your balance a little bit. Some of these are a bit easier to do uh, with an aid, like a net or a wall, so you can always do that too, no problem. And then finally you think, okay, well, yeah, feeling pretty loose. Better get those wrists and those ankles ready to go. You're gonna need them when you play as well. And again, look, this is only gonna take a few minutes for you to get your body going. Of course, if you're really deliberate, you're gonna spend more time on this. And at least a little bit, it gets you moving some little mini jump squats there, that's fine. It is important to realize that as you go, you're going to need to sort of increase the intensity here, right? Because the movements in the warm-up are going to be a little bit slower than the movements in the game. So you do have to start to gradually increase the explosiveness, right? Whether you're moving left to right or up and back, varying the footwork, getting to those short balls that just clip off the top of the net, for example. Right? So you're going to want to use different kinds of footwork here. And again, all this, you can do some visualization as well. Never a bad idea. So that's how I like to warm up and get ready. Again, this is just sort of like a physical warm up before we start even hitting balls. You can do your own variation, of course. Whatever it is you do, do it deliberately. Make it so that you're less likely to get hurt. Go out there and have a great time. All right, so this next segment is a bit of a mixed bag. It's a little bit of a hybrid, 
Hybrid? That's not a word. It's a bit of a hybrid. It's a combination of a segment about technique, but also about coaching. What we're going to do here is we're going to talk about the technique you might use when returning serve, specifically the grips that you might use. But what we're also going to do here is talk about some coaching best practices. What should you do as a coach to really sell a topic, to really make it clear what you're doing and why to your player? So let's get to it. When returning serve, it's important that we use the right kind of grip to give us what we want for the return. Consider that when you're returning serve, you're returning from a pretty long distance away, and you typically want to send the ball back toward the baseline of our opponents. We want to send that ball fairly far. So notice what we're doing here. We're talking about the return of serve. We're setting the context, making them be able to understand how what it is that we're doing, sort of where that fits into a game, right? I'm returning serve. Now notice also when we do this, where I'm standing on the court. Well, where do you return serve from? You return serve from the baseline. So even though you're demonstrating just by dropping the ball to yourself, you should be standing in the realistic spot at the baseline. Again, this is gonna help them connect what it is that they're learning to the real game of pickleball. So there's two grips that you might use that are gonna make for effective returns. The first is what we call an Eastern forehand grip. So an Eastern forehand grip is where my hand is just slightly behind the handle of the paddle. And this is a useful grip because it's in a strong hitting position. And so I'm gonna be able to hit this ball with some power and still have the stability I need. I could also use what we call a continental grip. And a continental grip is where the V of my hand is right on top of the handle here. Now, while this isn't as strong a hitting position, you'll notice that it does open the paddle face slightly. And so that's gonna make it easier for me to send that ball with an arc. Let's take a look. Okay, so let's stop for a second. Did you see what I did there? What I wanted to do was make sure that we showed them that there were different options, that there's not just one way to do things, but there's a couple, right? They can use, they could use the continental grip if they wanted to, if they wanna get that nice open face and have a lot of versatility, they can use their forehand and they can use their backhand. Or if they wanna just change the grip just slightly, now they're hitting slightly behind the handle, which is a really strong grip to be in when you're hitting the forehand at least. And of course, there's that backhand option as well. So this is the thing. I think that's how it was. So this is the thing, when you're coaching, it's important to give your players options, not telling them that they have to do this or have to do that. Give them some options, help them understand why one might be preferable to the other, or at least what the advantages and disadvantages are, and then they can go from there. Both grips are fairly useful at getting the ball deep in the court. One through a bit more speed and one through a little bit more height. But what about the backhand? Okay, so notice here how I gave them both forehand and backhand examples, right? And I demonstrated them so they could see them on the forehand and backhand side. Too often we as instructors only focus on the shot like we tend to like the best, or maybe our players like the best, and that's often the forehand. But it's really important that you show them what to do on both sides of their body and that you can demonstrate it as well. If I use an Eastern forehand grip when I'm hitting a forehand, that's okay. But if I use this grip when I'm hitting a backhand, my hand is now in a really weak hitting position. It's gonna provide me without very much stability when hitting this ball. So there's a couple of things that I could do, is I could use that continental grip on the backhand as well. It's a slightly stronger hitting position, and I'll still get the open paddle face to be able to send that ball with some height. I have another option. I really like the Eastern forehand grip, but I want to use it on the backhand as well. I can use my second hand, my non-dominant hand, to provide more stability and support when I'm hitting. So even though the forehand is in a relatively weak position, the dominant hand is in a relatively weak position, using a forehand grip on the backhand side, by using the non-dominant hand to provide more stability when hitting that return of serve. Of course, on the backhand, I could also use the continental grip, again, because it's a relatively strong hitting position and it makes it easier to send the ball up. Okay, so there you go. If you're a pickleball player, now you can think a little bit more about the grips you might be using, the continental grip, the eastern forehand grip when you're playing those returns of serve. And if you are gonna use that eastern forehand grip, maybe consider two hands on the backhand. If you're an instructor and you're watching this, here are some of the takeaways. One is we wanna make sure that we set the context, that we help our players to understand where in the real game of pickleball does what we're about to talk about take place? In this case, the return of serve, right? Second is hit your shots from a realistic position on the court. If you're talking about volleys, then you should be up near the non-volley line. And if you're talking about returns of serve, you should be back at or really behind the baseline. 
It's important to demonstrate to your players what it is you want them to do. Show them the different variations, right, so they can see it. Don't forget, when possible, to give your players options. Help them understand that there's not just a single way to play pickleball or a single kind of technique, but there are different options out there that come with advantages and disadvantages, and maybe help them to make the right choice. And finally, try to make sure that your instructions are correct, concise, and really clear. Say as much as you have to, but try not to say more than that. Then you can spend less time talking and more time practicing. You know that lesson planning can be tough and boring. That's why I put together 12 of my all-time favorite lesson plans, just for you. We made them super easy for you to follow, whether you're working with individuals or a group. These lesson plans can be easily adjusted depending on the skill level of your students, and they cover a wide variety of skills that players of all levels love to work on. We make the teaching points crystal clear and easy to follow. We even have video examples of some of the drills. You can choose the lesson plans that are right for you, and then download the PDFs so you can bring them with you to the court. With PCI Premium Lesson Plans, you can spend less time planning and more time teaching. Get your lesson plans today at PCIPickleball.com. All right, I love singles pickleball. I love playing singles. I love coaching people who are playing singles. I love doing broadcast commentary during singles. But one of the things that drives me crazy is when we watch good singles players be reluctant to come forward to the net. We know in doubles pickleball, you return serve and you come into the net, right? And there's a whole bunch of good reasons for that. But in singles, you know, eh, people are a little nervous to do this. So I've got a few clips here from our good friends over at the PPA. And uh, it's Leia Jansen playing against Annalie Waters. And I want to use a bunch of clips to sort of really try to illustrate this point about singles pickleball and why coming forward is so important. And I'm hoping by watching this, if you are one of those reluctant players, or no, a player, who is reluctant to come forward in singles, that maybe this will change your mind. Okay, let's take a look. All right, let's take a look here. We've got Annalie Waters and Leia Jansen, footage courtesy of the Pro Pickleball Association PPA. Now let's look at this point. This is a really nice way to start out this little lesson here. So look how deep this serve is. Jansen is well behind the baseline. Good deep serve from Waters, and Jansen chooses to stay back. Now look how deep Annalie Waters is, but watch what she's gonna do. She's gonna hit this return, she's just as far back. She decides to come in, and look at this, as Jansen's hitting the ball, Waters is still at the baseline, but she keeps coming forward anyway, and look what she can do, swinging backhand volley. So even from a not great position, remember Jansen was hitting from backcourt while Waters was still on her baseline, Annalie's able to come forward and get that advantage. That is a really nice highlight here. Let's look at another one. All right, again, Jansen Waters. That's This is all going to be Jansen Waters. Now, notice this one here. We'll watch the whole point, then we'll break it down. Waters having to scramble. Jansen puts it away. Okay, so what is it that happened here? So Jansen serving at the top of your screen. And once again, you're going to see a good deep serve. Look where Waters is. She's three, four feet behind the baseline. She's going to return and stay back. Jansen's also at the baseline, but she realizes, okay, Annalie is putting no pressure on me. I'm going to put pressure on her. She comes in. Look where Waters is. A little bit off balance here. And now it's just left and right. Jansen working Waters till Annalie has to put up the lob. Easy overhead put away for Jansen. And again, this all materialized because Waters stayed back, giving the opening for Jansen to come forward. And look at her going left and right and left and right. You can control this. You can take away time when you're up at the net. You can play angles. You can't from the backcourt. That's why it's so important. That was a very good overhead. That short, sharp angle. Okay, let's look at another example here again. The advantage of coming forward. The disadvantage of staying back. So Waters stays back. Jansen stays back, back, back. Their baseline grinding away. It's impressive, but no one's going to win the point very easily like this. All right. Now, in this case, this is a bit of a counterpoint to what I was saying. You're going to see here that Jansen, she's the first one who comes forward after this extended baseline rally. But what is it that happens? Well, Annalie Waters, she just plays too good a shot. Let's look at it here. So deep serve, Waters is back, chooses to stay back. Jansen, behind the baseline, chooses to stay back. Waters, way behind the baseline, still moving to her left. She's going to hit. Jansen is still back. Waters is still back. Baseline, ground strokes. 
the crowd loves it because like it's exciting it's nice to hear them hit hard we like that but if you want to win the point you have to come forward in singles Jansen hits this ball and now she sees that there's an opportunity here I mean there were other opportunities but she takes that one here's where the trouble came Look how low this ball is. She's got to hit up on it. She's at three quarter court. It's a good low ball by Waters, but that means Jansen can't hit with much speed. And she doesn't really make Annalie run either. Look how well Annalie is set up here. She's able to drive that ball down the line. And Jansen plays a pretty good volley, but Annalie, I mean, I don't want to say she got lucky, but she got a little bit lucky here. It was a very good shot, right? But the point here is that Jensen gave herself the chance to win the point. And I'm not sure out of 10 volleys that Jensen hits like that, how many of Waters is going to hit back for a winner. Anyway, let's move on here. Let's look at this other point. Waters stays back, gives the opening for Jensen. Doesn't do enough with that ball. And here we go. Now, you might say, well, Mark, look, Jensen came forward. She lost the point, and it's true, she did. But she had the chance to win the point. She just didn't take advantage of it. She didn't make Waters move the way that she needed to to get her off balance. Here we have Jensen serving on the near side. Waters stays back. Okay, Jensen's at the baseline. What's she going to do? She drives that ball, and she comes in. This is excellent. This is great. Look at how much Waters has to run. She's stretching. There's a lot of court to the right-hand side. So when this ball comes back, Jensen has got to play like a good angle here. But she lets this ball bounce. Notice how she steps back, and that is going to give time to Waters. Emily gets back in the court, and look, when Jansen hits this, Emily's almost in the center of the court. There's not a ton of an angle, Jansen and all of a sudden now we get a counterattack, a little bit of a drop from Waters. So that decision to let the ball bounce, remember, when you come forward, you are stealing time from your opponents, and as soon as you step back, you give them time. All of a sudden, Anna Lee realizes Jansen's in a lot of trouble. She comes forward and pounds that cross-court forehand volley. So again, it's not only about winning the point, it's about giving yourself chances to win the point. And in that case, Jansen had the chance, just didn't capitalize. It happens. Easy to save from back here while you're watching. Okay, let's watch another one. Deep serve. So look at this. Annalie, she's the first one to come in because Jansen doesn't take advantage. And then it's like taking candy from a baby. So, deep serve. That ball might have been out. Anyway, good sportsmanship from Jansen. Look at how Annalie comes forward. Working her left and right, using the angles, forcing the lob. Easy. Got another example here coming up. And again, this is sort of a recurring theme. I just want to sort of share with you the examples. Okay, Jansen coming forward, and that is a great drop from Anna Lee. Great angle there, Jansen. Mm -hmm. Again, so the two main advantages you have when you come forward, they both, I mean, they, they both have to do with time, right? You're taking time from your opponents because you're hitting the ball sooner than you would if you're back at the baseline. Right, baseline to baseline is 44 feet. A lot less distance that ball's gonna travel when you come up to the net. So you're stealing time by getting closer. Yeah, that's just not good enough. Uh, getting Stealing time because you get more high balls, right? But it's not a guarantee. If you put balls back in the middle of the court where your opponent can set up well, like Anna Lee does there, she's going to pass you every time. And so what happens is when we play singles, there's sometimes a bit of a fear, right? That you have to go for so much on the return of serve or go for so much on the approach shot that if you don't hit it well, you're going to get passed. And sometimes that's true. But if you're staying back at the baseline, you're really not putting much pressure on your opponent. Look at Jansen working waters back and forth, back and forth. That until that one volley doesn't move Annalie enough. Let's see, she's fired up. Let's look at the replay here. So here's the volley that did not move her enough, and now Jansen's in trouble. Again, the problem wasn't coming to the net there. The problem was not really capitalizing, using the angles and uh, using speed the way that Jansen probably would have wanted to. Jansen coming in. Again, look how much Annalie has to chase down those balls. Open court backhand volley, nicely done by Jansen. Got a couple more points here to look at. Of course, this was the uh, the old rules where you were allowed to use this chainsaw kind of serve. This ball clips off the top of the net. Jansen does a good job. And again, look at how hard Annalie has to work. Again, sometimes I wonder, you know, 
I think players, it's important for them to go back and look at these highlights and see themselves and sort of notice, like, hey, when I was coming in, I either won the point or gave myself chances to win points. Right? When I didn't win the points, the coming forward wasn't so much the issue. It was the, you know, the volley that didn't go enough into the open court, for example. Call the score six nine. We see Jansen again. Annalie is on a little bit of a string here going back and forth. It's a hard way to earn those points. Jansen, good job up there at the net controlling things. Let's look at one last clip here. Again, this idea of coming forward in singles pickleball is so important. You can steal time by reducing the distance the ball travels, by getting those high balls. You can also use angles you can't from the back of the court. If you're a singles player, you got to be brave. you got to be brave out there. And nice job jumping the corner, putting away that angle. Cannot do that from the baseline. Nicely done. This was a great match, by the way. You should go back and check it out. Uh, love these best three out of five game matches that the PPA and some of the other tournaments are now starting to feature. Really great camera work as well. Thanks for this video, courtesy of the PPA. If you play singles, be brave. Come to the net. It'll usually pay off. I promise. Good luck out there. So we've had race to 15 games. We basically. Okay, so there you go. Do you have to come forward in singles? No, of course you don't. And are there some times where it's smart to stay back? Yeah, I guess there is. But the impulse, I think, if you want to be a good singles player, the impulse has to be to try to get forward quickly, to not have these long extended baseline rallies where you're essentially inviting the opponents to come in. And as we saw in some of the clips here, even if you're shot, your approach shot isn't amazing, or even if you're not in the best position, sometimes just coming forward is good enough to apply that pressure. So be brave, go out there, and come to the net.